Welcome back to Beards and Brews. Hey, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and follow no matter where you're listening. Not only does it help us out, but you'll know exactly when we have another one brewing. Fellas, today we're taking a one-way trip to hell, and we're going to ride shotgun. This is Hobo with a shotgun. What'd you think? Boxcar Willie starts with one hell of a Tarantino music quartet. Okay, already out of the gate. <laughs> uh, we got to talk about the Tarantino influences for sure. Personally, I got a lot of John Carpenter in it, but I, you know, I can definitely see Tarantino too. Okay, yeah, the John Carpenter stuff definitely in the back half, like the hospital and forward, totally a John Carpenter movie. But it does have that feel of the resurgence of like seventies filmmaking and like the mm-hmm. Tarantino effect, and like they're just writing dialogue with all these fucks and hex and stuff when it doesn't necessarily <laughs> make sense. You know, they they right. hear it but they don't understand it. Well, it is in Technicolor, so that does give a little bit of credence to your uh, 70s influence there. Yeah, it wears its influences on its sleeves, which isn't bad at all. It's actually quite good. I do enjoy that the fellows they picked for this, the main villains, we get like a guy that looks like Bricktop or some shit from Dick Tracy. He's the main <laughs> villain guy. What's his name? The the Duke or the Drake or some shit? Drake. Drake. Yes, because yeah. this is a Canadian picture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the more that I watch with that idea sinking in my head, I'm just like, Oh, this this is cute. This is a cute little Canadian movie. Look at these boys doing stuff. Definitely oh, cute. <laughs> now, the the guy that plays Drake, to me, I didn't get Bricktop. I got the guy that's on the cover of Death's album Spiritual Healing. I don't know if that's a niche enough reference for you guys, but it looks just like him. Oh, okay, that's a that's a good one because I was feeling like a really shitty Kenneth Copeland or yes. Kenneth Copeland. Yeah. Yeah, no, right there with you. I also got Kenneth Copeland. This guy is just like an obviously evil televangelist. And, and I know that we collectively had fun watching Rutger Hauer, but that guy, that Kenneth Copeland dude in the suit, was having a blast. Yeah, that guy, you could tell he was one taking everything that he was doing, but he was doing it so good on the first take that it truly did not matter. I could believe that, especially towards the end when he's just like, trying to stoke the crowd's excitement. He's having a good time. Looked like a good time to me. Who was having a good time is definitely our the the Drake has two sons, one of which looks like a young Joe Manganiello, and the other guy he looks like current day Tom Holland Spider Man. Yes, I'm I'm glad because like while I was watching, you know, I never really think of like henchmen's names or whatever, even though these guys do have them embroidered on their jackets. Nice, yeah. but like I, yeah, it was just Tom Holland and Biff from Back to the Future. That's all it was. <laughs> to me, I think I think the guy that you guys are uh, saying, Tom Holland, God, he reminds me of someone, and I like it's the guy that plays, uh, you know, the one guy in Fury Road. Ooh, oh, love a Nux. Yes, that's who he kept reminding me of. Yeah, yeah, Nux is the cool one. Fuck you, Slit. Yeah, witness me. I was gonna say there's a good correlation between those two because these kids, these pieces of shit. They're just tearing up this town, turning it into just this wasteland, but they're all doing it for the approval of their pops, Drake. (laughs) Every time you say Drake, I just imagine, like, Drake. It's all about that hotline bling. I get it. Damn it. I do enjoy that the Drake and his son's sense of justice and the only way that they could try to, you know, get respect is to take what they do in robocop and turn it to a 10 these guys are like the worst clarence boddicker type henchmen ever yeah because they will literally do whatever it takes in the worst fucking way there's a scene for god's sakes that had me dying laughing whenever you get to see these slc punk kids attack some bums with bumper cars and they oh yeah wow just wow there are plenty of scenes where I know, like, we know these are bad guys, but they have to show them do baddy stuff. Mm -hmm. And the one you mentioned was pretty stellar. Like, there's this homeless fella, and he's just like, what are you doing? Let me go. And you see these fellas zooming around in bumper cars. You're like, oh, they're just having a fair, whatever, having a good time. (laughs) And then they ram two of them into the man's head, and he pops like a Gallagher watermelon. And it's just so absurdly juicy. And it just made me cackle. Like, I was just like, okay, the filmmakers are having a good time. I'm having a good time. One thing I did notice in this movie is just how, I don't want to call them the audience, but everyone that's just around, like the bystanders that are having fun, they just don't give a shit that they're covered in blood, just like the front row would not give a shit that they're covered in watermelon. Whoa, they got the splash harp. (laughs) Yeah. 
Some of them do, but later on it is very apparent that, like, everybody in this town, no matter what social hierarchy, you could be a cop, a regular person, not even homeless, but you got shit on you. Yeah, everyone seems to be real blood horny. I think we're... Ooh. <laughs> yeah, they are, because way later on, they're hunting homeless people, and there's a woman, and she's straight up just like, oh, you're, I bet you're wondering if I'm homeless or not, so you could kill me. And the guy's just like, yeah, are you? <laughs> yes. It's such a good response, because it's almost Monty Python style. It's a whole, <laughs> well, I got better. Because <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's so... I guess, out of character for the scene. You want to kill me? Yeah. Have you got a bed? <laughs> Is it in a room? <laughs> All right, then, carry on. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Is there a roof over that room? And everyone's like, ooh. <laughs> ooh. And there's always that, you know, his wife's just like, don't get stingy. Three walls is good enough. (laughs) So you guys want to set the stage for what this movie is. Uh, This is Hobo with a shotgun, and that Mm -hmm. hobo gets that way by rolling into a town (laughs) called Scumtown. It's true. I watched this with the missus, who is Canadian, by the way, and she was absolutely irritated by this whole thing. (laughs) And her argument is like, there's no place like this. No place like this on the map. And I was just like, I don't know, Dartmouth. I don't know enough about Canadian geography, but I'm just going to go, oh. <laughs> I, I mean, it's it's a very localized joke, but the reason why I sure. picked it is because this movie is co-produced by the old company that used to produce Trailer Park Boys, and there are some Trailer Park Boys in this movie. There are. We get to see one of them right away uh, for a minute. Yeah, but he's got to split. Oh. <laughs> uh... <laughs> yeah, one of the first real opening scenes is uh, Ricky from the Trailer Park Boys, and he runs out with, like, a a manhole cover wrapped around his neck somehow. I don't know how they do that. I don't know the physics yeah. behind it. That is somehow, like, did, did they, uh, like, cut it in half and then wrap it around his neck and then solder it back? Not solder. Uh, weld it back? No, they just that- cracked him over the head with it like a cartoon. <laughs> this just pops out like a Ooh. single, like, little piece. Just boop. Now you're just in that predicament. Good luck. You're right. I should not be putting logic into this. Carry on. I mean, there is a lot of that in this movie. We're just like, yeah, okay, that just has to happen. Fine. Any other movie we'd pick apart, but this is clearly Ricky's worst case Ontario. (laughs) Yeah, so they they drop Ricky from Trailer Park Boys down into this manhole so that, you know, his head is just sticking up and his body is being weighed down, you know, just dangling underneath the street. And they wrap a, a razor wire noose around his neck. They do. And to make this even more Canadian. They pull his head off with the other end of that barbed wire tied to a Bricklin. (laughs) Holy shit, what a deep cut. Yeah, I don't know anything about that car. A Bricklin is a strictly Canadian-produced car that is very reminiscent of the DeLorean. We gotta edit in that, like, fucking gif where it's like, the more you know. Right. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. Like watching this movie and now being a resident of Canada, it's just it's very Canadian. Like everything, just the neighborhood, fucking Ricky, the Bricklin. It's, I don't know. It's just super apparent now. It's it's really weird and fun. So you did mention the uh, Quentin Tarantino influence, and once Ricky gets his head ripped off, I can't help but think of Kill Bill. Right. Yep. It's just a fucking blood geyser. Look, every squib, every spurt of blood is just cranked up to 11. Like, we're going to get to parts where entire rooms are cleared with a single shotgun, and there's not a person left on their feet. It's fantastic. Not only are rooms cleared that way, but, you know, it's a pretty hot scene when you can clean a whole fucking bus out. (laughs) (laughs) There are times in this movie where it does kind of go above and beyond its own characteristics that like for some reason like yeah we get these are bad people doing bad things but sometimes it begs the question is it really necessary because sometimes it does come off flat out mean and i get that like like, you know that's the joke but i'm just like that was extra for no reason (laughs) these are the only unnice canadians that's what they're trying to show you honestly like this whole movie is kind of maximized for no reason you know like everything about it and that's that Mm. goes with like that quentin tarantino influence i guess but like so much of the dialogue we've talked about the dialogue is just like it's almost it's almost for shock value like yeah yeah. Oh my god, yes, dude. You are nail on the head because they will be talking about something and Rutger Hauer 
will honestly deliver a line that is poignant and means something and has like so much emotion behind it. And then suddenly they'll cut to the guy he's talking to and he, he'll he just say some shit like, I love the way her asshole smells. Now get <laughs> over here. And you just go, what yeah. the fuck? That happens a lot, actually, especially with the two kids of Drake or whatever, you know, uh, Biff and Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. You're you're 100 percent right. They'll actually be having a coherent conversation about their schemes, their plots, whatever they want to do. And then one of them just like, ah, piss dick cum shit. I'm just like, what? <laughs> Uh, they, they steal a line from the late great Dennis Hopper and his film Blue Velvet when they roll upon the scene to kill both the hobo and his lady. Old boy goes, "Let's fuck." I thought that was just what Dennis Hopper said all the time. The only thing I know about that movie is what you have said about it. Like I, no. I know that people are into weird movies, much like we're mm-hmm. reviewing Hobo with a Shotgun right now. But sure. this is like. A weird fucking movie, and it's got a good fucking actor in it, and so you're just, the whole time, unsettled. Yeah, that's what I was trying to bring up. It has this weird line between comedy and abrasiveness, and it's almost like the latter doesn't need to exist, because it does the former in spades. Wait, are we talking about Hobo with a Shotgun, or are we talking about Blue Velvet? Because that sounds a lot like Hobo with a Shotgun to me. You've got, like, one really good actor, and he's out there throwing out, you know, tears in the rain type monologues. Yes. And then we're getting back. The only thing I'm gonna let slide is my dick in your pussy. <laughs> we're all on the same page. Oh, and also, please go in the blue velvet, that. thinking it's a comedy. <laughs> now, with our our good friend Taylor Swift, the hooker, we get introduced to her as she saves a young boy who owes money to one of the I, I guess you would call them the the Drake's kids. And he says, "Where's my money?" And he's gonna burn him with a fucking Zippo lighter. Breaks his arm over a joystick. The dude is screaming bloody murder. He slams down what looks to be a sock full of cocaine and yeah. is like, do cocaine yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah, he just his problems <laughs> fixed, I guess. No, but not only his problem, like anybody else in this arcade slash dungeon just helps themselves to a pile of whatever. Well, I don't know if I've mentioned this quote from my uh, psychology teacher in high school before, but I mean, he does give a very topical uh a reference for what we have here it's whether you have a broken leg or a broken heart cocaine will cure it he actually said that and we get a lot of that in this movie because hey i just exploded your foot here take a face full of cocaine you'll be all right (laughs) that's another one of the acts of vulgarity that the maritime mafia you know throws down on these people like he just takes a hammer like gallagher and explodes a dude's foot and it's so out of left field. And it's so gruesome. It just made me laugh. Like, I didn't know how to interpret the whole scene other than comedy. It's it's and because it, there's just, like, a ludicrous amount of viscera. 100% it's Mortal Kombat 3. You blow up one man, three rib cages, eight skulls, yeah. 24 <laughs> arm bones. That's a bit toasty. <laughs> toasty! <laughs> You guys like Rutger Hauer's sock club? Old change in a sock? And he's like, shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> yeah, it's just enough to dish out justice, but not enough to leave a bruise. I mean, it's not like he had soap to put in there. I mean, yeah. His line delivery for it is so good, though. Mother Teresa is a goddamn saint. <laughs> Whop. I, I got that one written down, too. There's a lot of that. Um, that one I was all right with. I was. I had to pause it on that and be like, what? Yeah. All in all, all these disgusting acts are put on display only to get Mr. Hobo's attention. So what does he do, fellas? Vigilante <laughs> justice until he gets arrested. Uh, arrested? You're not wrong. Is that... Maybe just got? Am I being detained? Am I being detained? <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Don't tase me, bro. He's the cuffs guy. I'm going to break these cuffs. You can't break those cuffs. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Please, now that I've entered the police station, that guy's got a knife. What's he gonna do? He's like, Just chill out, man. I'm gonna carve my name right into you. <laughs> <laughs> he does turn into like a lawful good situation because he thinks, you know, the justice system can still work at some degree, and the town isn't totally devoid of some kind of like check and balance system. So he brings in this dude who's roughhousing that uh, hooker that he likes. He's like, you better book this man or I'm going to shoot this place up or something like that. And they're just like, okay, I guess. <laughs> but he's figured out that the justice system has abandoned him, literally abandoned him in the back yeah. of the alley in a trash can. 
<laughs> and he is found by prostitute Mickey, and she's like, oh, let me take you home and give you a cocaine bear sweatshirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like a lost pet, she just kind of takes him home. Mm-hmm. And I know they're trying to be kind of endearing. You know, they're both on the wrong side of the tracks, and they've kind of found each other in this odd situation. And he's on the cusp of becoming this town's vigilante, a successful one at that. But the whole time they're talking and they're going back and forth and they're leading him towards the bedroom so he can get like a nice place to sleep. I'm like, please let him take a shower. Yeah. Please let him take a shower. Absolutely. At any moment, he actually changes clothes into that cocaine bear sweater. I'm like, oh, that's nice. New thing in clothes. It'd be great if he took a shower, though. Can't do that. I might wash the blue out of his eyes. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. Those are steely for life. Gorgeous fucking eyeballs on Rutger Hauer, y'all. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, all the more reason to love the man. I mean, this man is... No, not basically. He is holding this entire flim up. 100%. Especially his speech right after he gets the, the sweatshirt. And he's like, uh, Let me tell you a little story, baby doll. <laughs> you take a bear's cocaine, and he will. <laughs> I repeat, he will claw the face directly off your skull. We've seen it. True. And if you fuck around with the coke and the bear long enough, Ray Liotta will come after you. And you know what happens when Ray Liotta comes after you? He fucking dies. That's what happens. Oh, no. (laughs) All right. So now we get a taste, gentlemen, of some of the bedlam that drives the hobo with a shotgun to become Travis from Taxi Driver. (laughs) He sees Santa (laughs) kidnapping children. He sees pimps pimping. And Ryan Dunn is there getting filmed for bum fights. Yeah, I was going to say we have left out this bum fights dude because he's kind of like a a little bit of a catalyst for all of this. Like he's like you can kind of see from him being there that the homeless population of this town and it is a lot is really just there for like the amusement of like everyone else. Like they are not treated as humans. They are just treated as like, Hey, chew on some glass for $5. Yeah. That'll be funny. Yeah. We're going to put it on the internet. Then he goes on Dr. Phil and just fucks with him. Yeah. The guy they got to play the bum fights guy reminds me of, you guys know who I'm talking about. He's a horror movie director guy. His name escapes me. He did hostel. Oh, Eli Eli Roth. Roth. yes. He looks like him a little bit. But you're right, Chandler. He is kind of like the catalyst of this whole thing because, you know, when he does wander into town, he runs into him for the first time. He's clearly not interested in chewing on glass or fucking doing whatever for the 10 bucks, which is like 750 American. (laughs) But like after this whole change of heart and everything, he's like, you know what? Instead of saving up money to buy a lawnmower to start my, I guess, my own business and making a living for myself and possibly working my way up the social ladder, I'm going to buy the shotgun. I don't blow the shit out of everybody in this town. (laughs) Well, like, he has to come to that decision pretty quickly because he's in that little pawn shop where everything is. And three guys come in and is like, this is a goddamn fucking robbery. I know. And I know he's got to be the good guy. But the whole time I am thinking, like, you can just take it. Yeah. (laughs) You know? (laughs) No, he Um, he can't. He's too lawful good. He is. Like, not only does he grab the shotgun and dispatch these fools, but he slams the money down the counter and leaves like a boss. <laughs> okay, so this was a shotgun that was just hanging on the wall. He picks it up, and it's already loaded. That seems both dangerous and illegal. Just a thought. Also, like, how many shells does he does he pump through? We He's never see him reload. Ammo. He's got the infinite ammo headband. Oh, oh, is that what right. it is? Yeah, he's already passed through town a couple times on multiple difficulties. Mm. Yeah, he's achieved that. Yeah, this is his third playthrough. That's, That's why pre-ordered. he's <laughs> I pre-ordered, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. I didn't know Scum Town was pay to win. Oh, oh, you know, oh yes. Honey, Garbage. life is pre to win. I don't know why I called you honey. That feels awkward now. That's okay. <laughs> I'm Canadian now. <laughs> <laughs> but he starts to dispatch vigilante justice one shell at a time. We get yes. to see not Eli Roth eat the videotape before he is gut shot. Uh, <laughs> Cat Williams is, in fact, pimp down, pimp down. Yeah, he's a pimp named Slickback. It's like a tribe called Quest. You say the whole thing. <laughs> God damn. All right. <laughs> And we are delivered one of the vilest fucking lines I have ever heard uttered on film. And I've watched some fucked up movies. There's a creepy pedo Santa. Yeah. And he is watching two children play. 
and begins to masturbate and says, I'm going to come down both your chimneys. What the fuck? Yeah, but fortunately, that entire creepy scene is interrupted by Rutger Hauer's shotgun in his face. <laughs> True. And he's like, I'll give you something to jerk off about and blows his head clean off his body. Mwah. Chef's kiss. The amount of cocktail sauce on the car window was worth it. That gore is the worst gore in the film, though. It's just like someone took one of those cherry pies you got from Kroger's and just smeared it on the glass. Oh, dude. Plus 10 points if they just like bought one of those gas station empanada things and just threw it at the window. She's like, Hook. yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a feast for the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> and just like that, this hobo with said shotgun has reached his maximum potential. Speaking of maximum potential, what I've got here today is from Lagunitas Brewing Company out of Pelatuma, California. This is Maximus, their colossal IPA, 9.0% alcohol by volume. This is a big boy. Just right off the nose, it is really sweet. There's a lot of malty sweetness right there. Not as much hop, not as much like green floral notes as you would think. You do get a bit of that on the palate, but it's still, you know, you've got that sweet malty base that really reminds me more of like a barley wine than a, a double IPA. This is full bodied, as full bodied as it gets. But honestly, I'd like to see what it tastes like in like two years, which might sound weird, but it is what it is. Fucking decent. <laughs> yep. More of the good old ultra violence is quick to follow uh, as we get a speech from Papa Drake to little baby Tom <laughs> Holland. And he says, son, the idea has become the institution. People aren't afraid of you because you're my kid. They should be afraid of you because I'm afraid of you. I want you to go out there and make me scared of you. And this motherfucker 110% takes this to heart. Now, what he does to me, oh no, it's deplorable, yes. He gets onto a school bus, amps the kids up in a fun way, and then proceeds to set them all alight with a flamethrower. Takes their charred remains on the national news and says, <laughs> don't fuck with Spider-Man. <laughs> but 110%, it's not this bit that gets me it's what comes of it later whenever this character spoilers is lying dying that was an odd choice i'm gonna put that out there like i mentioned earlier that there is a moment or a few moments where the violence is just so well violent like it almost doesn't belong in this movie like it almost like they're trying to tell us something like there's, some, there's something below the surface but for, I, I just I, do, I don't get it it's not like, about the money it's about sending a message <laughs> fuck i guess but like you're right brady like this guy lights up an entire yellow school bus with a <laughs> flamethrower and then when he gets his comeuppance and he finally meets his end he doesn't just die like any kind of movie villain he steps onto that same charred bus as it takes him straight to hell i honestly thought this was very nightmare on elm street yes i fucking loved that bit he's on the phone with his dad spoiler again He's just had his cock blown off and he is bleeding out. <laughs> and he's like, Dad, I'm dying. I don't know what to do. His dad's like, son, you're going to be okay. I want you to know that I love you and that I'm very proud. And in this honestly, like, fairly touching moment, he's like, Dad, you were pretty rad too, but I got to go. And the school bus pulls up, the door opens, and just plumes of black smoke roll out. We are then showed the rear of the bus, which they did whenever they were torching it, minus flame, and there he is, pressed against the back glass, screaming. Yeah. And I went, holy shit. If this were like a short story or like an adult's bump's tale, that's a fucking visual and a half. Yeah, and it, I, I kind of wish there was more of it or none of it, because by mm -hmm. itself, it doesn't make any sense. Is it a cool visual, an idea? 100% will not take it away. But in the context of Hobo with a Shotgun, it, it, I don't know. It just kind of happened. It's out of left field. Never brought up again. It doesn't really add anything to me. Do you think it might be a little bit too poignant for Hobo with a Shotgun? Yes. Uh, yeah. 100%. A very fucking cool moment that has no need to be there. And you yeah. go, this is better than half the movie. <laughs> it, it's it, better. It's... And that makes it worse. Yeah, it's almost like before yeah. Ricky got his head popped off by a Brooklyn, 
he like it went through this whole spiel like how he turned his life to Jesus and it was completely sincere and believable. But he still gets his head popped off and it sprays like a geyser. It's just like, all right. I'm not well, here for good writing. I'm here for people to have their brains exploded like fucking pimples. Like, I, I want to see gruesomeness. I don't want to hear, yeah. like, good well, dialogue. I want to see someone throw an ice skate, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to my top men, and I'm talking top men, your wish is granted. Ooh. What about your bottom men? Oh. We don't talk. <laughs> I just walk in. You know what this is. Oh, Bruce Willis with a shotgun. Ah, oh, fuck. Well, we get a big chunk of what is this? The Purge next. And you were talking Basically. about how the violence is crazy, mm-hmm. dude. There's a woman in a dumpster, and she's like, "Please don't kill me and my small infant baby." Covers the baby's eye, and then the dude just hits him with a Molotov cocktail. Fuck. Yeah, turn that bitch into a dumpster fire. Oh, oh. <laughs> you can't beat your wife like you can beat a whore. Yep, I wrote that one down too. That's two cops, by the way. Yeah, but the the police force, <laughs> I'm using quotey fingers, is just that. They're just kind of there, but not there. I can't I can't not say the next line. You gotta give me you gotta give me a chance for that one. She's so hot, I wanna eat the peanuts out of her shit. <laughs> That's directly from mm-hmm. Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal yeah. Jacket, yeah. Yeah. He then refers to her as a fuck tube. Yeah, that was super quick, too. Like, it changed scenes right after that. I was just like, wait a minute, pause. Did he just say fuck tube? <laughs> I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> She's a school teacher. <laughs> yeah. I like how he just holds on to this uh, misconception, uh, forced misconception, maybe, that she is a school teacher this whole time, even though from the get go, she's like, yeah, I fuck for a living. Well, I mean, that's, yes. just, that's just the character's perception. It's kind of wrapped up nicely at the end. Like, he knows that it's just his idea. Like, mm-hmm. that's just like his projection onto her, especially after the whole hospital scene. He's talking to the babies. He's like, you know, there has to be like a, a version of ourselves that went a different direction. Yeah, okay. there's so much poignant shit in yeah. this movie. That's actually my favorite part of the whole movie is the hospital bit. Because it's fucking good cinema. <laughs> like, for yeah. whatever reason. Like, we went from getting a trailer park boy decapitated, and now we're seeing Rutger Hauer put in the same fucking effort he did in Blade Runner. What? That's fucking... where I'm at through this whole thing, honestly. Just remember, fellas, this man's got a dream. He wants to start a lawn mowing company. You grow <laughs> it, I cut it. And then she goes on to describe that grass grows other places. Rutger Hauer looks at her with the most sincere look I've ever seen, his gorgeous, steely blue eyes, and says, <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> well, you know, he's going to have that sweet van that says Blade Cutter on the sign. Oh, my God. Oh, speaking of Blade, I forgot to mention, whenever fucking Ricky got his head cut off, that bitch does a goddamn Blade blood rave dance in it. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, see, that's the movie telling the audience, yeah, this is that kind of movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a bitch in a bikini and a fur coat, basically twerking on a blood fountain. Welcome to Dartmouth. <laughs> I don't know. I keep just shitting on this place. <laughs> now, we, we get to the hospital because the kids try to decapitate the... <sighs> but one of them gets toaster cuted, and it makes him come. <laughs> yeah. He's kind of pissed off about it, but also <laughs> yeah. impressed. Yeah. Yeah, he's wearing wearing ice skates for whatever reason. I guess it's easy to slice and dice somebody on the ground that way, but he gets the the toaster jammed up in the the rollerblade, not rollerblade, the ice skate, and like half of his body is charred. He's walking around looking like Two Face. Yeah, you know, and he's quirky, for lack of a better term. <laughs> yep, this is a quirky movie for sure. Now, in the hospital, when old girl is being resuscitated, they're like, "Don't die on me, whore," and they bring her back. <laughs> Rutger Hauer's delivering his speech under that red light, and we get introduced to two of the coolest fucking rando movie villains I've ever seen just shoved into a film. I I didn't know if they had a name. I have them written down as the Apocalyptos. Oh, what are they called? Like the the Scourge? The Slurge? Um, The Slurge. (laughs) The Plague. The Plague. Yeah, they're the villains from Mandy, pretty much. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like, what can we do that's vaguely German circa 1933 to 45? (laughs) That'll do it. It's definitely like post-apocalyptic, like 
Nazi mustard gassers or something. I don't know what they're trying to do, but that's what that's what they give off for sure. It was definitely like a cool addition, last minute for sure, and like they kind of don't need explanation at that point. Mm-hmm. So like I was just like, okay, fine. There's 20 minutes left. Let's see where this goes. I was not disappointed with them in any way, shape, or form. The fact that they walk in and there's like three doctors who are like, I've had enough of this shit, and they say nothing commence to do kung fu butchering where their (laughs) legs are chopped they fall down the second plague guy puts a noose around their neck shoves it into an m203 grenade launcher fires it into the ceiling hanging them holy shit he has a noose tube it begs the question was this a little too complicated and an overuse of equipment just to take out some doctors (laughs) you know no these guys are having fun at work and I applaud them. If you're going to do a job, do it right. <laughs> it did look pretty fun, I will say that. That is true. But speaking of doing their jobs, before we move on, did you guys like how Rutger Hauer treated these doctors like you would yell at a mechanic? Like, fix her! Fix her now! <laughs> and then pours a bottle of vodka over her, like, neck wound. To which the doctor yelled, you can't do that. He's just like, I don't want to fix her or something. Yeah. Or she's a, from my homies. She's a, she's a school teacher. She gargles yeah, out, I'm I'm a hooker. I fuck for money. That's a new hole. Don't fix it. No. no. <laughs> Man, if you like it, you can keep it. Oh. <laughs> but even though the scene is fucking killer in every regard, this does put the good old hobo evic shotgun in kind of a sticky situation because he gets yoinked yeah everyone is in a sticky situation because everyone is covered in fucking blood and guts and viscera and mud and shit that's just how this place is oh so it's basically just middle ages england because if Mm. they ain't got shit on them they're a king that's That's why the drake wears the clean white suit i think you're onto something hey that's some symbolism not too shabby they end up dragging Rutger Hauer out of here, and all that's left is Abby the hooker, and they leave the shotgun behind for some stupid fucking reason. They don't know it has hacks. That's their call. Uh, they missed out on that one, because they could have had, like, a really expensive weapon. You could have gotten, yeah. like, 20000 30000 gold for that for sure. And it gets upgraded, too. I mean, after a while, they do just attach an axe to it, or like an axe attachment, if you will. I'll tell yeah. you, I have no idea what she's doing during this next montage, but Abby takes this, this shotgun, combines it with a, a lawnmower and an axe and some other stuff, and she turns mm-hmm. it into, like, one of those Power Rangers super weapons. Oh my god, yes. Yeah. Good fucking call. Hobo with a boomstick doesn't quite have that same panache, you know? I think it sounds great. <laughs> Now, whenever she gets this upgrade, did you guys enjoy that she runs off through the crowd like Eartha Kit and Ernest Scared Stupid? I mean, <laughs> this whole scene was a little too wacky for my liking anyways. <laughs> that, that's the bit where the guy's just like, well, are you homeless or what? We're, we want to kill something. Let us know. <laughs> Get your hands off me. You're crushing my smokes. <laughs> uh, she runs smoke, out in smoke. like a, a military jacket and like slap bracelets. You guys, yeah, I don't know what the slap bracelets are for, but uh, she's, a she's got like baby. a welding. Hel- yeah, she's got a welding helmet, and like the entire townsfolk have like torches and pitchforks, going to go after homeless people, and she just has to give like a speech. It's like just because these hobos don't have homes, <laughs> that doesn't make them home. You know what? They've got the biggest homes. The streets are their homes. So that doesn't make him... You're the homeless man. Yeah, it doesn't work. The the speech doesn't work. Like, I get it. But I totally expected that guy who just asked her if she was homeless so they could kill her to be like, well, are you? Yeah, uh, that's what (laughs) I was expecting too. Was like a big, violent scene of them being like, okay, she's homeless. And then they all come after her and she fucks them all up. But instead, she just kind of runs off through them and like a little, I'm weighed down by all this gear scurry. And shows up just in time to save Rutger Hauer with all her fucking cool shit after he lost a 2v1 casket match with fucking the plague. (laughs) Dude, the plague is kind of vague. I mean, they do have those, like, uh, mecha soldiers or whatever. By the way, they're mecha soldiers. 
but there's like a brief inkling that like it's also this tentacle monster that's kind of held underneath the headquarters of the bad guys. Oh yeah, yes. what the fuck is that? Anyway, next scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have to save Rutger Hauer from decapitation while the Drake is basically doing his best. I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is where all the chaos happens. I mean, not all of it, because there's been a lot of chaos, but there's uh, a lot of chaos going on right now. There's Rutger Hauer about to get his head cut off. We covered that Abby uh, stops that, and then she gets her hand cut off, her Uh, fingers or something. She puts her hand in the lawnmower. Why does she do that? Anybody got an answer? He's trying to push her face into the lawnmower and she has to make an option like in her head do i let him push my face or do i try to put my hand against it to stop it yeah well i just want to say this part of the movie sucks i fucking hate this idea i Mm. hate it i don't know it makes me feel weird this is kind of like the final girl of the movie it just makes me feel weird that she didn't escape unscathed you know that's kind of like the thing you do and they just turn it into this wacky thing that just is dissonant from the scene they're trying to shoot because it, it leads up so fucking strongly. You got Drake, our man, Mr. Copeland, just raising hell, getting everybody amped up, ready for this big showdown. And then mm-hmm. it just, it kind of farts. It kind of farts. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of have that opinion, too, I think. I liked, number one, the gore. Number two, I liked the idea that they didn't finish through, which is unfortunate. Uh, they kill one of the plague. And since Abby killed him, the other plague is approaching while she is weak, one-handed, bleeding, ready to die. Rutger Hauer is preparing himself for the final sacrifice to save the last girl and to kill the villain. And he says, she killed Grinder. She must become the new plague. And I was like, oh, fuck, that's kind of cool. And then Mm -hmm. Rutger Hauer went, look in my eyes. And he goes, I guess I'll leave. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's what happened with that. Okay. Still have uh, one of the sons left, right? The last thing I remember about him is uh, he's like making his last entrance and he's like, they're going to make comic books out of my hate crimes. Uh, Pretty good. But he does get blown away at the end by his dad. So he's just like, how do we end this character? Well, you're just not in this movie. Bye. (laughs) Yeah. You were always my second favorite. Sorry, son. Ah, shucks, dad. I always then, liked mom better anyway. <laughs> Your mother sucks cock in hell. Ref- God damn, she got their riding shotgun. Yo. Oh. Well, speaking of man with said shotgun, he gets got pretty heroically. So at the very, very <laughs> final end, our handless heroine is kind of just bleeding all over the place. She helps Mr. Hauer out of the ground. And the cops fucking show up. Of course, right on time. Yeah, and you know who shows up right behind him? The townspeople who are finally on the side of the hobo, I think. Yeah, even the cops were confused because like, all right, put the gun down, we're killing you. Then everybody's up in arms and they're just like, what? Y'all are being real gay right now. I don't like it. What's happening? <laughs> you can't just be switching sides. It's bullshit. And everyone dies. Like all the villains, all the good guys, besides the final girl, just die. I guess. And... Scene. The cops? Do the cops die? I don't. Oh, I don't yeah. know. I mean, shit. eventually That's... they all will die. You know, succumb to the passage of time. But the movie mm. just kind of stops. They're just like, "Yo, hey, we got the ninety minutes later." Yep. Get yeah, two. So you're telling me at the <laughs> the very end of this, this town is now without a police population. There's no hobo population because the townspeople have already wiped them off the board. And the cartel, or whatever you want to call them, that has been running the town, along with the police, has now been wiped out as well. Chandler, welcome to Dartmouth. <laughs> A fun time, is all I gotta say. <laughs> oh, I totally forgot my sequel idea. Oh, just Go for it. Awesome. So, uh, the movie just kind of ends. I fucking hate that. So, my idea was that his whole idea, he just wanted to fix her. So, maybe she wanted to fix Rutger Hauer. So... He takes well, what's left of her and him like to the next town. She does the same fucking thing, but she doesn't know any doctors, but she knows a lot of like scummy techno whatever. Maybe even the same people who made like the, the Nazi folk in this one. So the idea was he would just basically get like the $5 million man treatment with all his new upgrades. He is now a robo hobo with a shotgun and he can yes. now continue his vigilante justice streak across the great nation of Canada. Robo hobo. 
with a shotgun. Dun, 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 dun. I think that that is a fucking masterpiece waiting to happen. Yeah, it just has all the hallmarks. You can just like throw as many Terminator references, RoboCop, just whatever. Well, Jim, the there. movie, it's, it's fun, man. Rutger Hauer is a fucking gem. And without him, this wouldn't have been anything. 100%. I love the gore. It's wild and it has some fucking banger one-liners. Thumbs yeah. up. This movie is not as good as I remembered it. I watched it fairly young, you know, still a teenager, and I thought this thing was, you know, pure cinema excellence. It's not that, but it's a good time. If you realize it's supposed to be goofy, like, the violence is extremely sharp, but it's played for laughs. With that mindset, you're going to have a good time. Recommended. This was my first time seeing it, and I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't expecting this. We've talked about it wears its influences on its sleeve. If you like low quality Quentin Tarantino mixed with low quality John Carpenter, you're probably going to like this, especially if you lean toward ridiculous gore and shock value. You're going to be into this again. Rutger Howard better than this whole movie. Still pretty decent, though. There you have it. That was Hobo with a shotgun. If you have any strong feelings about the show or the movie, leave in the comment section below. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons. Be sure to bash the bell icon down there, too, so you don't miss what we've got brewing up next. Get out there and follow us on social media. We got that Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit. You can find us anywhere. Podcasts are available. Check us out. We're kind of funny. Don't. Maybe we'll come by, pick you up for a car ride. We'll go to hell. By God, you'll be riding shotgun. Nice.